usually have to call something else. Is recording? Yes. Okay. Okay. Close that. Okay. We're good. So Mary, <laughs> abounding in patience, <laughs> clicks on a whole bunch of things <clears throat> and can't figure out why we had <laughs> settings messed up. Uh, we went, took dinner to Alton and, Alton and Kathy yesterday, and Alton's not doing well, and Kathy is worn out, so keep them in your prayers. And and Phil and Cherie have a very similar situation. Cheryl, how is how is your leg? Can she unmute? She can unmute. Um, much better. Thank you for asking. Still doing physical therapy and icing and stuff, but getting better. Well, that's good to hear. And Larry never says anything, but how is your hip? You know, oh, great. No, so we're great. all doing a little better today. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, had, I slept last night. <laughs> Sleep is good. <laughs> uh, Julie's doctor, they did blood work and they said the inflammation uh, count, the number is down. So uh, the medicine is doing some good. So we're all, we're in pretty good shape. Um, God, we're always thankful. We have these times where we do better, where we're feeling better, and we often forget to come back and say thank you, and we are thankful for that. We're thankful for the times that we've had no other resource but to come to you, and, and I'm still amazed at times that we forget to do it when we think things are going so well. Be with us here as we study. We're getting down into some difficult last parts. Help us to help us to stay on track uh, to find the things in this that would bring us closer to you. Amen. So, <clears throat> before we get started, sir, where are we where are we going? I think we are on week twenty nine of Matthew, and I I think we have this week and next week. Um, yeah. m most likely. And so then we have the month of March and the last Sunday of March is Easter. We, we will rec pre-record a Easter message for you. We will not be on an Easter. We are going to go to Tucson with Julie and Sirius with a dog um, and see Amanda and Elise and Finley for Easter. So we will be gone for Easter Sunday. What we're going to do for our next study, I believe, is we're going to really dig into the Passover. And I've got a messianic um, book. Messianic are Jews that believe that uh, Jesus Christ was their, is their Lord and Savior. So um, anyhow, a messianic book that really goes deep into the Passover from the first Passover and um, anyhow. We were thinking we would start how, where we got our Bible, but we've just spent over half a year yeah. on one book. So <laughs> we're going to go for something a little bit lighter than that. Um, okay. So where do we leave off? Um, a couple of weeks ago, we left off on chapter 27, verse 26. I'm going to go back up to uh, verse 24, um, but Jesus was put on trial, and I'm, I'm putting that in quotes um, because it wasn't much of a trial, and do you want me, do you want to say something before I start at um, 24? No, go ahead. Okay. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but that instead a riot was breaking out, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he says. You bear the responsibility. All the people answered, this blood, his blood be on us and on our children. So Pilate will re release Barnabas to them, but he, but he had him flogged and handed him over to be crucified. So I wanted to reread that to be sure that that part didn't get lost. Um, they've been having this discussion about what to do do I, do I release Barabbas or Jesus? And this isn't going the way Pilate expected. Pilate 
some people will say, well, he was not a very good leader. Pilate was smart. He lasted for, I don't remember, 20 years in this job, and it does not have a very long lifespan. Pilate is very politically astute, and he's not going to do anything that doesn't help him. So he sees that if he kills Jesus, it could spark a riot, and that reflects badly on him. But if he doesn't, you see what's going on here, they're starting to riot anyway. So he does the expedient thing and does this hand washing. He says, you know what? None of this is on me. This is on you. You want to do something, you go do it. I got nothing to do with this. And it's a, it's a you know, kind of an interesting approach to this. But it does show Pilate was a very politically astute leader. Uh, and so he, you know, he hands them over. Uh, he released, actually releases Barabbas to them and, and hands him over. And he has Jesus beaten. Um, and you would think, well, if he's just going to turn him over to the Jews, why would he do that? Why, why go to that trouble? He is walking that thin political line and if he just lets him he says here you know then if someone questions whether Pilate was loyal to Caesar and to Rome he might have a problem so he beats him he says look I wouldn't soft on him I beat him I, I had him beaten pretty soundly what they did after that is all but he's playing he's playing this whole game and it fulfills all of this stuff fulfills prophecies along the way so um, we are on verse um, chapter 27, verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company around him. So they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt down before him to mock him saying, hail king of the Jews. Then they spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head repeatedly. After they had mocked him, they removed the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to, cruci in, in, to crucify him. And I, we talked about this even last night. Um, Rome is sort of cocky, as they can be. I mean, Rome is the, the big kid on the block. Uh, and this guy claiming they they say, even though he never said he was a king, uh, he's been accused of, of saying that he's the king. And this is just Rome saying, nobody's king here unless we say so. And so the, the abuse is just, you know, it's, it's the hazing that goes on in football locker rooms. I mean, you get enough people together in these situations and that stuff happens. I don't think there's anything that tricky going on. Um, oh, the, the Praetorium, the Praetorium, what is it? Yeah, yeah it, it is essentially, it's the headquarters. Uh, the Praetorian Guard are uh, Pilate's personal guard, bodyguard, and they're the toughest of the tough. Uh, we don't know how many of them were there, but the, the, uh, this place is the headquarters, and it sort of sits up the hill a little bit. They have a good spot to keep an eye on the city. Uh, and, and I would guess, you know, probably 40 or so were in on this particular beating. Verse 32, along the way, they found a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross of Jesus. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall but after tasting it he refused to drink it when they had crucified him they divided up his garments by casting lots and sitting down they kept watch over him there above his head they posted the written charge against him this is jesus the king of the jews two robbers were crucified with him one on his right hand and the other on his left and those who passed by heaped abuse on him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of, of God, come down from, from the cross. 
In the same way, the chief priests, scribes, and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the robbers who were crucified with him berated him. So, you know, it's to be expected. Uh, they want to put down this, what they see as an uprising, this threat to their power. Uh, you know, the saying, nobody loves you when you're down and out. Well, as now that, that they've put him in this position, they want to be sure that everybody watching gets a taste of it. You see what happens when you challenge us. You see what happens when you challenge Rome. Um, there are a couple of things in here and coming up that I wish we didn't have to try and explain to you because I can't, I can't explain them. Um, it says that the two robbers berated him. And that appears to be at odds with what Luke says, that one of them says, this is the son of God. And I have read so many people trying to explain this. And, and you know, they just make stuff up. Um, we don't know if maybe the one, the one guy said some things that were unpleasant and then at the end says, no, wait a second, this was the son of God. We don't know. What I'm telling you is what it says is that the two robbers berated him. And Luke says that one berated him and the other one said, this is the son of God. And I have no, you know, I've got no answer for it. Um, I, I And like you said, it, it, you know, when people are trying to poke holes in the inerrancy of the Bible, I mean, you can easily make a case that different people heard different things. And this was, like you said, he braided him at the beginning and then at the, towards the end, he decided. It's no. important for us to remember that, that this is never intended to be, nor could it be, word by word, sentence by sentence of three and a half years of Jesus' life. I mean, it would be too long to... To study. So, you know, these people who were inspired to write gospels were inspired to write certain parts. And, and one of them tells part of the story, one tells another part. This is one place where they appear to be at odds. And I don't know, I don't know, we just don't have enough information. Um, what do we know about um, uh, Simon? Simon Cyrene? Yes. Cyrene is North Africa. Uh, he is probably a Jew. There are, you know, the Jews have been dispersed. He may or may not be black, but he comes from a place in North Africa. And this is the way they could do. They could just pick you up off the street and say, here, go carry this for Rome. And, and you have to do it. And so that line where it says, if someone tells you to, to you know, go with them a mile, you go with them two miles. They slap you on this side of the cheek. Well, this is an example of that sort of thing happening. The, the, the soldiers take a guy off the street and say, hey, you carry this big, heavy cross and you do it. And what he was saying, when these people do this stuff to you, go a second mile. Don't, you know, don't fight them. That's kind of a hard lesson. But here's that lesson actually, you know, played out. That's how, it, that's how it could come about that someone could say, carry this for me. And I'm going to go back to, in, in this section of your Bible, there's a lot of footnotes that, um, that in Psalm 22 prophesized a lot of this thing. So do you mind if I just read no, it's great. Psalm 22? It's just so, remember, Psalm 22 was written, they believe, by David a thousand years before this happened. And it's called the Psalm of the Cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my words of groaning? I cry out by day, oh my God, but you do not answer. And by night, 
and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They sneer and shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me forth from the womb. You made me secure at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, and trouble, for f trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. They open their jaws against me like lions that roar and maul. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax. It melts away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shared, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs surround me, a band of evil men encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of wild dogs. Save me from the mouth of the lion. At the horns of the wild ox, you have answered me. Those are the main parts that goes on. But. It's pretty uncanny. I don't know if you caught all of that, but the number of references that are being played out in Matthew's gospel that are identical. I mean, you see why that psalm is messianic but my you know my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth he's thirsty they give him this you know vinegar and gall uh to, to drink but they've pierced his hands and his feet and you just keep going down the list and it and, and to the point that david cries out my god my god why have you forsaken me and that is you know exactly what jesus says on the on the cross so there are so many things coming together right here at the end uh, that it's, it's, it's uncanny. I'm going to let you read um, verse 45 and 46 so I don't kill the Hebrew. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Word for word from, you know, what Psalm Mary 22. just said out of, out of Psalm 22. Uh, and, and obviously at this point, you know, a change has taken place. Uh, this is that first separation, I think, that we've talked about. Um, anything else on that? No. When some of, the sta when some of those standing there <clears throat> heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. One of them quickly ran and brought a sponge. He filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and held it up for Jesus to drink. But the others said, leave him alone. Let us see if Elijah comes to save him. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. At that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After Jesus's resurrection, when they had come out of the tombs, they entered the holy city <clears throat> and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and said, truly, this was the son of God. And many women were there watching from a distance. They, were they had followed Jesus from Galilee to minister to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the Zebedee's sons. So here's another one of those that I wish I didn't have to tr talk about. 
because it's only mentioned in Matthew, not any place else, none of the other Gospels. Uh, and it talks about when he died, that the tombs were split open and that some saints, some uh, people were raised and they actually appeared in the marketplace. People saw them. I have, I got no explanation for that. I mean, it says what it says. I've been over it a lot. It, it, it seems like when he died, the tombs were split and then they don't come out until he's resurrected. Okay, yeah, verse 53 mean, says, they, after Jesus' resurrection, when they had come out of the tombs, they entered the holy city and appeared to many people. Were they sitting in there waiting? I don't know. I mean, I just have no answer for this. And again, the, the scholars argue with each other and call each other names. Uh, what I would like to suggest is if you have your Bible, if you're reading this, uh, around 52, 53, the tombs broke open, the bodies uh, were raised, and after his resurrection, they were seen. All right, that's what it says. I want you to look at verse 54. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and said, truly, this was the Son of God. I don't think you can read any of the, the first part without verse 54, because there's a purpose to this. Just the, like there was a purpose with Jesus' miracles. The miracles, and if, you, if you're reading it in the Greek, when it talks about miracles, the words really come out something like authenticating signs. These signs who authenticate who he is, who he was at that time. And these things that happened, I don't have an exact explanation for, but it does say that because of these things, the Romans themselves, at least a number of them, looked at what happened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. So these signs played a part. These signs were important just as they had been through Jesus' ministry. Uh, and, and we know from well, like when Paul goes to Rome, we know there were a lot of Romans who converted, a lot of Romans who became believers, who became disciples. And this is, this is one of those times where they, they were able to look at this. Strangely, the Jewish leaders probably didn't, but they were able to look at this and say, this is not normal occurrence. This was the Son of God. Um, and I was going to say something. Um, oh, the last part about all these. Um, Mary was a popular name. Yeah. So we, we've got Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and then the mother of Z Zebedee's sons. And remember, Zebedee's sons were the, the boys of thunder, and that is James and John. James and John, yeah, yes. sons of thunder. And, and I might as well, some of you have probably heard this. But they talk about Mary Magdalene a lot. Do you know what a Magdalene is? <laughs> yeah, that's what it seems. It sounds like a cookie. I always, when I was a kid, I picture somebody dressed up in, in, you know, like felt and green sleeves is playing. And she's like a member of some religious order, Mary the Magdalene. There's a town on the Galilee, just kind of right up off the northwest corner, you go up to the hill a little bit, called Migdal. And Mary is from the town of Migdal. She's a Migdalene. That's all it is. It's just how there are a bunch of people named Mary, so they refer to her as the Mary from, from the town of Migdal. And it's just nothing more complicated than that. But it does mention these, these women, and it seems like everybody's named Mary. <laughs> um, verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut into the rock. When he rolled, then he rolled a great stone across the entrance to the tomb and went away. 
Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. So this Joseph of Arimathea, we don't really know where Arimathea is. We think it's a town maybe not too far, six, seven miles outside of Jerusalem, but we really don't know. But we're told in other gospels, he appears to have been a member of the council. So part of the Sanhedrin. And we're told that he's a, a follower. And that he didn't vote for the crucifixion. or did he, he didn't vote for the crucifixion. But he's a follower, but in secret, because he's afraid of the Jews. So going to ask for the body is sort of a daring thing to do. And we're told in another one of the Gospels that Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus at night, also came at that same time. And they collect the body um, as someone should have. It's the eve of Passover. You don't leave a body like that. I mean, it's just not done. Uh, for them to have not made arrangements for that was, I don't know, poor taste. Uh, it's not done. And it's, a, it's you know, an ultimate insult. That body is supposed to be in the ground by sunset. And they just weren't going to do it. They were just going to leave him there. So these two men come and claim the body. And that, you know, see, becomes important. Verse 62. The next day... The one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees assembled before Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was alive, that deceiver said, three days, I after three days, I will rise again. So give the order that the tomb be secured until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. After this last deception, and this last deception would be worse than the first. You have a guard, Pilate said. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and secured the tomb by sealing the stone and posting the guard. So this is kind of cool. This, this, <laughs> this is one of those things. After Joseph comes and, and puts him in his own tomb and they roll the stone, the Jews start thinking, hey, wait a minute. He's been telling people in three days he was going to rise from the dead. And, and they said, this could be a mess if somebody comes and steals the body. Of course, they don't believe it could really happen, but they steal the body and it's going to start this legend. And we've got bigger problems than we ever had. So they go to Pilate. And this is kind of what I think is funny. They go to Pilate. Pilate doesn't care about their Jewish stuff. He just doesn't care. And if you remember, he has asked them, do you want me to kill your king? And they scream out, we have no king but Caesar. And, and so he's rubbing their nose in it. He put that sign up above Jesus that says king of the Jews. And again, another gospel, we're told, they said, take that down off of there. That's not our king. And Pilate sends word, I said what I said. You're going to live with it. You said you have no king but, but uh, Caesar. Live with it. And so he's really rubbing their nose in it. So they come and they go, hey, look, Pilate, look, uh, we need a guard there at the tomb so that nobody tries to steal the body and claim that he rose from the dead. And Pilate says, you got guards. You go guard it as best you know how. This is not my problem. And Remember, he washed his hands of it. <laughs> he, he washed his hands of it. And it's, it's like, you know, you figure it out. And it's, it's really a, 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 a gesture of contempt that just says, I, I don't want anything to do with you Jews. I gave you your way. You figure this out. It's kind of interesting that Matthew took the time to put this in. <laughs> No. Herod did, but not Pilate, Herod. to my knowledge, did not have. Yeah, it's possible, but I'm not aware of it. Okay. I don't remember reading the, the Jewish guy pointing Jesus after three days I will rise again. I remember that as having reference to the temple. 
he does say that with the temple, but there have been other um in fact, if you read what the 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 Jews, the the leaders say when they go to him, uh, they went to Pilate and said, "We re we remember while he was alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again." So that's whether we go to exact sentences where he said exactly that. They've heard him say something like that because that's what they go to Pilate with. So, um, chapter 28, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, rolled away the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards trembled in fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they hurried away from the tomb in fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them, met them and said, greetings. They came to him, grasped his feet and worshiped him. Do not be afraid, said Jesus. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So before anything else, here's do not be afraid again. Twice. How, how often? <laughs> yeah, twice. You know, the the first the the angel says it, and then Jesus appearing to them says, "Don't be afraid." We get this over and over and over again, and it's got to be one of those overriding messages to us because it appears so often that you know they have anything to do with with God or rep his representatives, and the first thing they hear is. Don't be afraid. It's okay. Um, so I know that there's several things I want to mention. Do you remember when he's born? I talked last week about how shepherds are not allowed to be witnesses in a trial. They're not allowed to be a witness to anything because they're second rate, third, third rate citizens they're not reputable. And yet when it comes time to announce his birth, who gets the message? Shepherds. He's, he's, instead of trying to pick, you know, the, the greatest and the, the, you know, the mayor and the governor and everything so that we have good reputable witnesses, he goes for the shepherds. And, and here at this, this end where his body's been laid in a tomb, there could have been some trickery, right? We'll, in the middle of the night, we'll distract the guards, we'll roll the stone, we'll do all this stuff uh, just to make it look good. Instead, it just the stone gets pushed back, the angels are there, and, and they're making no apologies for it. They're making no um, show of anything that says, oh, you just, it's just the tomb is open, He's not here. And, and it's the same sort of boldness that says this doesn't require any trickery. This doesn't require me to explain to you what's happening here. It just happened. And, and it, it is, I think the boldness of it is what always grabs me when I read the sort of bookends, the beginning and the end of this story is the, that it's just, you know, it's not designed to, to pull at your, your intellect in a way, it's about faith. You believe it or you don't believe it. But, right. but we didn't concoct anything that you can tell yourself, well, you know, probably. You and, here, and here the angel appears and Jesus appears to women, which once again, we're not, I mean, if you're going to appear to somebody, it wouldn't have been women at that time. Absolutely. Yes, John Paul. Well, it also it was in the morning. It was right before dawn. Yes. 
So it's happening during the day. It's not happening in the middle of the night. That's which is which is to me the real announcement. Because you know the Sanhedrin and all those guys, they did it in the middle of the night. A lot of bad stuff happens at night. They did, didn't they? <laughs> but his all of this, the angels roll the stone, do all this in front of the soldiers at dawn. I just brought that. It is just, yeah, well, no, you're right. They all did their business it, at night. And all of this is done. This is the first hour, even though, you know, whether it's fully light yet or not, it's considered the first hour, but that's day. Uh, and it's just, it's just that bold. It's just, you know, here it is, take it or leave it. Um, and, and you can see pretty good because, you know, if you duck hunt, <laughs> you, you know, you're waiting for that moment and it's 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 bright enough you, you see it and so i i, I think to, to me that's even more of it that's, that's even more of a of the fulfillment that it's the least of these the shepherds the women and at dawn the new day oh it's really it's pretty bold. It really is. I mean, it, the whole thing is bold. And, and if you're looking for an intellectual excuse to say, I don't want to believe this, there it is. You got it. If you look at this and, and you believe it, uh, you know, no, what other explanation could be better than the one we have? So, and that one thing about do, do not be afraid, and you talk about the bookends, I mean, you talk about the angel coming to Mary at the very first and telling her not to be afraid and telling Joseph not to be afraid. And here's the angel telling the women who are witnessing the resurrection, do not be afraid. I have heard people in the past talk about these things that we read about, say, I would like to see one of these things, one of these, you know, and I would suggest probably no, no, you wouldn't really. Because, because you see the prevalence of being told, don't be afraid. I mean, I think there's probably something to these kinds of encounters uh, that, are, that are, you know, trying for, for us humans. But nonetheless. But, but I think they should have done both. Jesus himself said to the disciples, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. And they found him and took him away. I've been in the public eye. The, the consistency gene is amazing. That is one of the things that always gets me when we do these. There's, there is another consistency, and, and it, it, it's when they're when when when. So when when he's on the cross. And I think it's the uh, it's the um, the one on the right, the, 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 where, where in Luke, where Luke says that, that one. Okay. So Luke says that 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 one on the right said, "Hey, uh, tells the other guy to shut up. That this is the <laughs> Son of God, and, and you know, and remember me." Yes. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 10, verse 2. The good is on the right. Uh, the evil is on the left. They, they do have that, that tradition. Yeah, they do. And so it's like, you know, consistently, even small things like that to me, and even though it's only in Luke where Luke talks about the two, of, you know, the two, but, but, but it go, you can find it in the Old Testament. Where in Ecclesiastes, he's saying that. A whole lot of things have just come full circle. A lot of uh, prophecies have come to fruition. And, and I just, the main thing I want to call to your attention is there is no attempt to sneak around. There's no attempt to offer up in such a way that, that oh, nobody can deny it. Anybody who wants to can deny this. He just opened it up and he's gone. Free will. Free will.
Verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And after the chief priests had met with the elders and formed a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and instructed them, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report reaches the governor, we, he, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the guards took the money and did as they were instructed. And this account has been circulated among the Jews to this very day. And, and there, you know, they, this story gets out and the Jewish leaders realize we got a problem. What do we do with this? The body's gone. They're just going to say, this is exactly what we were worried about. We can't have the story get out. So they, they gather up, you know, you think maybe more money than what they gave to, to Judas to betray him. But they gather up a large sum of money and said, look, you guys need to tell the story this way. And the guards are smart, you know. One way we, we say, no, we're going to tell the truth and they get killed. Or the other way, they get money and all they have to do. So they agree to tell the, to tell the story uh, that says that his disciples came and took the body. We can't do anything about that. Because what are they worried about? They're worried about Pilate. If Pilate hears this story... He won't be mad. He told us to put a guard there, and we obviously failed. But if we just say, ah, his, his disciples took the body, it's no big deal. There's nothing to get mad at us about, and the whole thing just goes away. That's the plan. I thought we'd actually stop here to do the Great Commission next week. Well, or do we you want me to do, do, do the Great Commission? Should I keep going? Okay. Let's go to the Great Commission. Okay. And I'll... Meanwhile, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we got done. The first thing is you might want to look at this and realize we've been on Matthew for six months. And there's all of this information in Matthew. And then it gets to the, the crucifixion and resurrection. And it's like a chapter and a half. It's just all condensed into the end. He obviously said that the important stuff is up here. And, and this was just the fruition of what had been prophesied for all this time. This is the, the beginning of the next chapter, if you will. Because he doesn't go into, um, it says somebody, doubt, one of the disciples doubted him. It doesn't talk about Thomas doubting him. It doesn't talking about going up to the upper room and seeing him. And it doesn't, it doesn't go into the details like the Gospel of Luke goes into um, about after his resurrection. This last bit gets referred to as the Great Commission. Those of us who grew up in churches know about the Great Commission. And I don't know about you, but I grew up thinking I was supposed to become a missionary and go someplace and do what this says. That's what they told us. You're supposed to go do these things. And what I want you to pay close attention to is he doesn't tell them to go to the world and make believers, right? We tell, but believer, that's up to the spirit, okay? Our job is to tell. What he tells them is to go out into all the world and make disciples. And there is a huge earth shattering difference between someone who believes and someone who's a disciple. The, the, the word that we translate to disciple 
is mathetes. And it comes from the same root as the word math. Does that give you some idea? It is the discipline, the teaching of a rabbi, of a master. You become a disciple and you agree to, to study and to live by the teachings of this master, this teacher. That's a disciple. Live by the discipline of the teacher. You can't live by the discipline of the teacher unless you know what the teachings are. That's why we study. I mean, ultimately, that's why we do this. Because to be a disciple, to follow teachings, you have to know the teachings, right? You can't get around that. And what he says is to go to all the world and make disciples. It is to, to, to teach. And Paul does such a marvelous job of this throughout you know, his, his writings. But he teaches people the basics. He teaches them uh, about salvation. But he also teaches them how we live, how we should live to be consistent with the teachings of Jesus. That's what Paul does, and that's what a disciple is. And, and you should see for the work of carrying this gospel message to the world, you need disciples. You don't need just believers. You need people who actively know the teachings and who actively follow the teachings. They're the ones who then have to go teach the next generation and the next generation about how to live in this Christ-like manner. And so, you know, that I think is one of the most abused little verses because it's always told to us, well, just go out in the world and, and, and be evangelist. Just go tell everybody. No, discipleship is work. It takes work to learn and to to begin to change your habits and all that you have to you have to spend time and work on it to say i believe that the the one on the the cross that says this is the son of god he says i believe great commission is is disciples uh and it's a it's a it's a hard thing sometime to um for some people to get their 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 hands around and here I'm stubborn I'm tireder than I thought but but the the main thing to consider that I want you to get out of the end of this is that that word disciple has importance for each one of us we're given all of these verses all of these scriptures so that we can be disciples not just so that it's an intellectual exercise so that we will understand these things that we're capable of and expected. So you, you, you started the, this part by saying disciple and believe are not the same thing. They're not. There is. So before I open my mouth and put my foot in it, can you please then try to tell me? Because I, I, I kind of didn't, I, I heard what you said about discipleship. But it, it almost made it sound like people can say I believe. That they can say I believe. That doesn't mean that they believe. They say I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, versus mm -hmm. discipleship. To me, belief comes after discipleship. True, true belief comes after discipleship. Because, you know, we can profess anything we want. That doesn't make it true. Because obviously, people may think it's true, but God knows our heart. So I, I didn't get the, the distinction. So what, 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 you what I contend, and there are some words that when they are chosen, they're pretty definite in their being. You don't select. I always go back and say that, that you might tell somebody, um, go get in the car and, and go to Walmart and pick something up for me. And they might, the person might have a truck. And you're, you say, yeah, yeah, they're all cars. But you don't say go get in the truck unless it's a truck. You agree with that? I mean, if it's a if you know it's really a car, you wouldn't select the word truck and say, hey, go get in your truck. And they would look at you all funny, like I don't have I, I don't have a truck. 
there are certain words that when you choose them have some very definite meanings. There are other ones that I try not to get, you know, too wrapped up in. But a disciple, Mathetes, is someone who has pledged. And, and if you're following a rabbi, you're a disciple. You remember, I, I come back to this a lot, where Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And these people say, yeah, that's a pretty hard teaching. Who can follow that? And they leave. They cease being disciples. You can't, to be a disciple, you can't pick and choose. You can't say, well, I'm going to follow this. But this other stuff you say, I'm not too crazy about. I'm going to pick and choose. That's not a disciple. It's just the way it is. And, and so, but you argue that you could, and it's, it's not saying the same thing as Mario. It's actually saying sort of the opposite is that you could, be, you could be a believer and not a disciple. You no. can't, and you can't, but you can't be a disciple and not a believer. I was just getting there. I would suggest that, that all disciples are believers, but not all believers are disciples. So, so, so like Nicodemus and, and the other guy that I can't think of his name that had the tomb. Uh, Joseph of Arab, I uh, know. Um, Joseph Simon. Do what? The, okay. The, was it Nicodemus? The, yeah. The, the guy who owned the tomb that went to get, I can't think of his name. Joseph of Arab. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Him, he, he was a believer or he wouldn't have done that. There, there were those guys that were believers kind of secret in the Sanhedrin. But they weren't disciples. Except it says here that Joseph, who himself was a disciple of Jesus. Mm, well. So yeah, yeah. So that that that. So he was, was, he was, was, <laughs> But but then on the other hand, he was still in the Sanhedrin. So it's Whoa. like that's a tough. I don't know. Yeah. Do do we not? I'm sorry. What's that? Well, let me say that. Jack, you want to pass that? I don't know. What are you saying? Um, sorry what no, I'm saying, no i'd really like to hear what you have to say okay well i was just thinking that you could be a disciple and not believe because you could study along with people and not um, be convinced yeah well, first of all, when you're saying they, the, to be a disciple, it is to be a disciple of Jesus him, Christ. of him. That those those Jewish leaders were not believers or disciples. Period. They they come right out and say so. That's the only reason I'm comfortable enough to to judge is because they come right out and say so. Um, I go back to the the artist, the the singer. Uh, named Prince that remember changed his name to a symbol but Prince told people he's a believer and I know people that say well look he died of a drug overdose and he did this and he did that and he did you know I don't know who has been granted authority to do that in this world if he says he's a believer I I, I don't have I wasn't given the, the authority to, to judge that. God judges, there will come a time. But to be a disciple, to actually, because there are lots of other rabbis at this time. There are lots of people who have disciples and they just follow what the, the teacher, the master says. Uh, and, and in this context, all I can tell you is, rather than parsing the words, he, he is talking about believers Go create disciples, though, and that is people who will follow my teachings. And the idea is they'll be able to also teach those teachings. And I think we see it borne out through all the rest of the New Testament. We see it borne out through all of Paul's writings, you know, some of the Peter and the other ones who write. We see this. The big thing is this is sort of a near and dear subject to me, the idea of being a disciple. You don't get to pick and choose. You don't get to say, 
you know, I, I like it when you say this. I don't like it when you say that. So I'm just going to follow this part. Well, now you're an admirer. You're not a disciple. You're an admirer. And, and that is the thing that in this last bit of the Great Commission, that word was chosen specifically. Methetes is a disciple. And he has instructed them to go out into all the world and create disciples. Yes, we tell people. Yes, we evangelize. Yes, there is belief off of the words. This Great Commission says, go make disciples. And, and I'm, and I'm... I think one of the key things that you said, it's hard. You cannot be a disciple if you don't know what the teachings are. And... And I always think to myself, you know, I felt like my faith walk, um, I believed, but I was sort of always sort of scared of the Bible and the fact that, you know, I would hear these things that you couldn't justify. So if I studied it too much, then I'd find a hole in it. And it's anything but the case. And as I study more and believe in the inherent word of the Lord, then but you can't, you can't, like you said, you can't be a disciple if you don't know what the teachings are. And maybe that's the last piece. I know it's got to yeah. be about that time. Because I haven't, I don't think I've offended anybody so far. It's been a little disjointed. But a lot of people in you know, a lot of churches, people come forward, they profess faith. They say, I believe. And then that's the end. So like Pilate, we just wash our hands of them. Right? They're not taught. They, they don't, a lot of these things that we talk about in here, they don't get taught. How can you become a disciple when you don't know the teachings? How can you live by the discipline of those, <laughs> those teachings and you don't know what they are? And they just don't get taught. That's one of my sort of pet peeves is that we just say, okay, you're good now. Go, you know, go over there, sing some songs, toss some money in, whatever, where, you know, work once a month at this thing that we do, but they don't, you cannot be a disciple, follow the teachings without learning what the teachings are. That's just logic. Doesn't make sense. Yes, sir. Okay, so so that goes to where he said, um, when people come to him and said, I did all these things in your name, and he goes, go away from me, I don't even know who you are. It also is, the way is very narrow, and the road to destruction is very wide because, because what you're saying right now, the Great Commission, if you, it, it, he's giving you the instructions, and, and I guess we all kind of pick and choose now, you know, it's like, mm, you're right. I, I so what that. are the two big things that he commands? You know, this is teaching people what I've, what I've commanded, and it's always, the, what are the two big ones? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the root of everything else, and you can, can find your way to everything else through those. But we go into, there's a lot more detail. There's a lot more explanation. But here we are at the end. It was, you know, This is finally the end of Matthew, and this is what Matthew leaves us with. He leaves us with Jesus, who has been resurrected. He says, I have the power to lay my life down and I have been given the authority to take it back up again. And then he leaves them with this instruction. Okay, now you go out. I have made you disciples. I have taught you all of the, these things. Of, of your, your friends now, because a servant doesn't know the master's business, but you know all of my business. I have made you disciples. And now what does he leave them with? Now you go take what I've taught you and you go make disciples of the same teachings. This is what we've been at for 29 weeks. But Scott, I think he gives them in the last part, he says, baptize them in the name of he does. And that's a tremendous hidden treasure that if you are teaching and you're beginning to learn the ABC, you're going to have to with the power, just like the apostles, Peter, somebody did. No. And nobody 
that even scarier. This baptism is a tremendous tool. Well, that's true. Yeah. And it's just not the disciples, even the, the ones that were doubtful a few minutes ago. Sentence before, and some doubted. That's okay when you doubt. Study, believe, bottom line, you gotta have that faith. If you don't, let, let me do it, and it's past time, but I'm going to close on one last thing because this got brought up, and I know something Mario said about how you can you can do things without believing. But to be a disciple, to follow the teachings, turn the other cheek, right? Uh, go the extra mile. We talked about that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Can you be a disciple? of that teaching without being a believer. I just don't think so. You know, God, also people sometimes, and I know you said about churches, and I'm not down to say that they don't think churches can do that, but it, 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 when it's all said and done, it's a relationship between you and God. So you can go to church, and like, like my pastor says, like, I'm just checking the box. You know, I came to church. I'm a good boy. I'm a good girl. But it is also your responsibility to continue to seek the word and seek the knowledge. Because, I mean, you can get food that all you want, but if, if you're not actually partaking uh, in an active form, it's... But, you know, Mario, we have, we have so many examples. Philip meets the Ethiopian man, actually gets sent out onto the road to meet the Ethiopian man who has come to Jerusalem. He has scrolls. And Philip finally gets, okay, he says, now God tells him, you go talk to this man. And, and he, Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, no, how can I if there's nobody to explain it to me? Paul talks about feeding people on milk, on baby food, until they get to the point. It, it, it is interactive. And, and the, the personal responsibility uh, is ours. And I realize that it is our responsibility to dig some of this out for ourselves, but there's also a very definite need for instruction. There's a, a I mean, a, an absolute need. And when you talk about being a disciple, following the teachings, chances are you're going to do a lot better. You're going to get there a lot quicker if you've got someone to teach you instead of having to dig it out. That's all I'm saying. Uh -huh. No question. Gather with people that you can grow from as opposed to just saying, okay, now I went to church today that I check the box on Christian. True. I can't argue with it. Anything else? Um, conclusion, Sorry. yeah. And when we pray, um, I. You guys don't make me a liar. I really want you to continue to pray for the gentleman that hit Peter. You pray, um, and that's a discipline. He's been really on your heart, and it is a discipline that we don't forget people. We pray once and, and forget. God, when we're done with these things, we ask for always the reminder of why we go through all this, why we study, why we learn more, is because in these scriptures, in these words, are lessons that are intended for us, lessons that teach us how to be better disciples, how to follow the teachings, uh, and not just say a few words. We're grateful for the time that we spend on this study, you've, you've brought some things to our attention, uh, things that you set aside thousands of years ago uh, that we can make use of, that we're intended for that, and we're grateful. We have these that we continue to bring to you, This the person who ran into Peter, and we don't even know his name, but you do. And it's your comfort in that, that 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 person not be 
weighed down by the weight of something that couldn't be prevented. As always, go with us. Help us to take these lessons. And at those times you set aside to have them come back to us. To remember this is what you've put us here for. Amen. Okay. Sorry for going over a little bit today. I hope you guys have a great day. The sun is coming out here, so that is good. <laughs> How are you feeling, Jack? Feeling good. Good. Feeling real good. Thank he, you. He's back. Hey, Mayor, I wanted to ask you about Jack Vogel. I don't know if Jack is he, They're here. Um, Jack's surgery is on the 29th. We should have lifted him up and he was on there, but his he's having surgery on the 29th. Uh, um, February. So, a couple sense. more weeks. Okay, you guys have a good week. Uh, you too. Thank you, Mary. Everybody. Yes.